welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of KIS Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. Our guest today is David Bernard Perrone. David is an agrologist and has a Master of Science in Plant Sciences from McGill University. He began working in greenhouse production in 2001 and worked for McGill in the Greenhouses and Horticultural Research Center for five years. He is the lead agrologist and one of the head growers at Whistler Medical Marijuana Corporation. Over the last year and a half, he designed the Certified Organic Growing Program at Whistler Medical Marijuana Corporation, making them the only fully certified organic licensed producer in Canada. Hey David, thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to chat with me. Hey, Ted. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I met David, what, two years ago now at Canacon. He came to yeah. one of my talks, and we started chatting, and I realized David was this wealth of information. Could you maybe tell me a little bit about your background and how you came yeah. into your current job and what you do now? Yeah, yeah. I remember when we first met, you were that breath of fresh air and that mal- maelstrom of craziness that was my first uh, two weeks in the industry. So. <laughs> I didn't know that was your first two weeks. Wow. Oh, yeah. It was pretty interesting. So I'm coming from an agricultural background, greenhouse production background. I've been working in greenhouse production since 2001 when I was uh, 14 years old, I think, at the end of my road where I used to grow up in the countryside. There was a greenhouse that we're doing production of annual flowers in the winter and uh, cuttings of poinsettias during the summer. So I was lucky enough that one of the manager there was also teaching horticultural uh, school close by and he was really interested he really interested me and got my eyes open and all the science and the cool stuff happening uh, beyond in the plants world and the greenhouse management and from the profitability to how we need to make the plants happy and all that so that was really the, the high opener for me and so I stayed in this world that uh, led me also to uh, do my bachelor degree in plant science and then when I was um, just for fun, I was uh, growing a lot of mushroom at university, uh, oyster mushroom, all sorts of stuff. And when one of the professors saw my work, I've been offered a master in organic agriculture and then ended up in grad school. And from there, I was bumming around every summer on the West Coast because I'm originally from uh, Quebec. But uh, so I decided to go and establish myself on the West and uh, meeting someone rock climbing and then keeping in touch with him, I heard through the grape wines through the years that he was doing something with cannabis. So I've got in touch with him once I moved to the West Coast and uh, he uh, let me into Worcester Medical Marijuana Corporation, which is the only certified organic licensed producer in Canada right now. You're working at this facility right now. What is your role at the facility? So I'm the lead agrologist. Uh, Develop with your help and advice. Uh, they are getting growing program there. Uh, so I got to place certified organic. So all the growing practices, uh, nutrient management, uh, soil recycling, climate control, pest and disease management, scheduling. So everything that touched the plant side of things, uh, I managed there. Wow, so you've essentially shown and proven that organic cultivation for cannabis can work on a large commercial scale. Yeah, absolutely. We are not the largest. That being said, we're fairly uh, a fairly small player in the industry, but still, we have one of the strongest brands in Canada right now. And everywhere we go, it's always uh, a treat to hear the people saying that uh, we're one of the best uh, product available out there. And you're a firm believer in organics. Do the importance of providing clean medicine to your patients, essentially. Yeah, we, we've seen it a lot, and the more I talk about it with other people, and when we compare our lab results uh, from Anandia Lab, which uh, Anandia is a really great lab in, uh, on UBC campus that's managed by Jonathan Page, one of the first guys that was one of the first to uh, sequence cannabis genome in Canada. We have a very high terpene content compared to other producer, uh, and the medicine is uh, very clean, and people really like it. So I think organic is a big uh, thing behind it to produce that like higher concentration of medicine than other uh, like for more plain vanilla fertilizer can do. So the premise then is that there's more benefit to organics because we don't know all the mechanisms for which cannabinoids are 
aren't necessarily the most beneficial yeah. to a patient. And organics, uh, can you expand on that a little bit just to explain to our users how the microbiology involved in organic production can affect terpene, uh, terpene levels in, in plants? We've seen some people that are growing with our program as well that have done side-by-side -side trials growing with our organic methods and with some conventional three-part nutrients with a few additives and the therpenes and, um, were higher in the uh, organic production. So the way it works, the way I like to see it, so like you mentioned, we don't fully understand what's going into the soil and the reason for that. A lot of those soil microorganisms, we simply cannot culture them in the lab. So. So it's hard to study them. When we build our soil, when we build our living soil, the way we see, we put all the best player in place, then we let the plant choose the interaction that they want to favorize, develop, depending on which life cycle they are already in vegetative growth, reproductive stage, or they're in the late senescent stage. So by letting the plant choose whatever it wants from the soil, uh, encouraging which kind of group of microbes do they want to encourage bacteria, uh, fungi, actinomycete, they really get what they need when they need it, and we're not force feeding any nutrients in the plant because they have they are in a plant available form and they're being pushed in the, the plant right now. So a lot of people are often asking me in organic, how do you flush your plant? Well, the thing is, we, we don't really flush the plant. It's still a concept that I think it's because people put too much nutrients or keep fertilizing too late in the life of the plant. So we just let the plant what it do what it does. So it's going to pump some of the sugar from the photosynthesize into the, the root exudate, encouraging specific type of microorganism that it can choose what type of sugar it push into the rhizosphere and the roots exudate to promote some uh, specific group and then choosing the type of nutrients they need. So we just put everything in place and then let nature do its thing. So really the plant controls this process. It's putting out exudates into the rhizosphere that control for which microorganisms make these nutrients available to the plant. To, to the best of my knowledge, I think that's what they do. Uh, so I, we don't fully know, but the latest research, that's that's what it showed. There's also a very interesting thing that I came across recently. It's called rhizophagy, uh, just plants engulfing whole microorganism and translocating, translocating those microorganisms inside your vasculature system. So it, there's a whole broad range of things that plant can uptake from single ions to whole microorganisms. So when you're uh, selecting in your living soil for diversity, a different type of uh, food, a broad variety of input, nothing in excess, but a little bit of everything. And you're doing the same thing for your fungi population, your bacteria, your actinomycete and everything. So the plants will really be able to just have whomever they choose to have, whomever they potentially evolve with for millions of years to uh, team up with them and then uh, maximize their genetic potential for yield and also terpene and medicine profile. Okay, that brings up a few questions for me. One, I totally agree with you with what you're saying here in regards to uh, putting the plant in control. Uh, do you feel, though, that I know a lot of growers out there want to maximize yield and they're really focused on production? Yeah. Do you feel that you're sacrificing yield by allowing the plant to naturally senesce or not trying to force feed ionic nutrients or, you know, a bottled nutrient program onto these plants? To be fully honest, maybe a little bit. We heard about those crazy like above three pounds of white yield sometime that I've yet to see under my organic system. I've seen often like oh, two and a half pound and more than profitable uh, yield that I've seen. But also the thing that I think, so when we're growing organically also, there's a price premium attached to that and there's a quality and there's a craftsmanship that goes behind it. So, so among the strongest brands that I've seen are organic and they've been recognized for the quality of the products. And I've seen a good uh, production facility that were producing consistently above three pounds of light, uh, according to them, but they were tired of that and they decided to switch to organic because the product was just not the best quality product ever. So those guys are willing to take a little bit of a yield loss to at first because they're a transition period and all that, but still those guys will make their two and a half pound of light and potentially three pounds of light. There's also the thing that 
there's not a lot of uh, plants that have been bred under organic production system right now. All those plants have been done by growers and small or big like breeding system, but they're all been under uh, chemical nutrients. So we where the microbiome is kind of more absent from that. And uh, a lot of the research we did in the lab uh, when I did my master uh, degree were focused around the microbiome that we were living inside the plant, the endophytic bacteria that will migrate from one generation from the, can be uptaken from the roots and migrate all the way into the seed of the plant. So over a generation of time, you can have an accumulation of endophytic bacteria into the seed that will make a plant better suited for organic production systems. So uh, I think that as soon as we're going to see breeders starting to develop for organic strains, we're going to see a whole new revolution out there. And I'll, I think most of those strains like been uh, developed for conventional production systems. I did not know that. So if you're an organic grower, finding seeds that are were grown organically uh, may actually contain beneficial organisms inside the seed itself. Yeah, absolutely. This wow. this um, it's it's a very like the first time we realized that uh, with one of my colleague in the lab, like I basically got shivers all over because this has opened so many doors because you can really build up beneficial population of microorganisms inside the plant itself and also everything that happens about around the epigenetics level of the plants, whatever that is not crossing and remixing of the chain, but more what regulates the, regulates the genes expression can be affected from one generation to another. So uh, epigenetics can be a very strong tool to adapt plant to organic growing systems, be to make them more uh, responsive to broader range of interaction with microorganisms, different type of nutrients, instead of just like, available ions like they've been selected forever now this just brings up an unrelated question that i've been i've been kind of curious about uh there's a lot of talk about degradation of genetic potential in plants with uh cloning over a series of years or mm -hmm. successively over time what, what have you seen with your background um, in, in terms of that being an, being a potential problem i it's not something that i've personally touch that much yet. Uh, I've been mostly focusing on uh, integrated pest management nutrients and soil over the last few years, but it's it's like you mentioned, it's something that we keep hearing, like the losing of vigor and all that. What I, I have observed personally, it's the vigor of a newly selected seed or mother plant. When you germinate a lot of seed, there is definitely a lot of vigor there. On their organic production system, we did uh, two pounds of light without CO2 when we just started a new strain from seed. There's some increased vigor there, so but I, I just don't know, to be honest. But it seems something that people have observed, so there might be something there. The why and the, the how, I'm not exactly too sure, but I think we've seen that like with, uh, with fungi in the lab. That's something that we have observed. It's like if you keep feeding the same kind of... Uh, sugar to the fungi and you're reproducing it under a petri dish it's going to become lazy for other type of sugar so when you're going to bring back from uh, let's say a malt agar on a petri dish to a wood substrate or it's, sometimes they get lazy they lost their kind of chemical matrix to digest other substrates so it might be something like that that uh, we see in, in moms kept under a longer longer term that's interesting. I heard some speculation from a friend of mine who went online by the name of Spur, and he talked about the potential for genetic degradation when cloning off of uh, unhealthy mother plants. That it actually had the potential to change the, the genes itself in the future uh, the future clone, but I haven't seen a lot of research on that one way or another myself. There's definitely something out there that can happen to the epigenetic level that, that I was talking earlier. So... Over time, the plants will over and under regulate some genes because it's been, let's say, you have a mom that's been growing for 15 years. Sometimes those strains have been passed from one grower to another, one cut from one plant. There's some level of control. The plants adapt itself to what they see. So I, I don't know more than that, but it's something that people have talked about. Then some old strain that I've seen people growing, the old original. Baba Pink Kush that we see a lot here in BC 
some people are doing very well with it and other people say, God, plus the vigor that cut is too old and people are talking about back crossing and doing some stuff to get the vigor back and just keep, but keeping the same string by popping new seeds. So, but it's something I haven't dabbled too much with, but it seemed to be there. Well, let's get back into your area of expertise then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one thing that I want to touch on is when you were talking about growers switching over to the style of growing that you're doing mm -hmm. and that you may not push yield quite as far as you would adding ionic nutrients. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about was all of the labor savings and nutrient savings that you're experiencing. Oh yeah. And that that's huge. I mean, as much as trying to up production, uh, reducing your expenses is a, and, and labor is, is a huge aspect of that. Can you talk a little bit about some of those benefits? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you, you bring that up because we all hear about the pound per light, but you don't hear a lot of people talking about margins. And coming from a commercial agricultural background, it's that's how people talk about. It's like some farmer, some farmer will take a yield loss and not plow their field one year if, because fuel is too cheap. They're going to reduce their yield, but overall, they're going to make more money because they save on fuel at the beginning of the season. So there's this old aspect where uh, we're where using living soil. You don't have to mixed bottle of nutrient day to day anymore or way less than mixing everything phing you have to take from like five sometimes 10 different bottles to make your nutrient mix uh, we do tub dress once or sometimes twice during the old growth cycle and that's about it for us so the labor savings are huge so all you have to do after that is to irrigate your soil uh, you don't push a lot of like salt in your irrigation system so you get less clogging we don't use a lot of those what's clogging mostly emitters it's potassium sulfate uh, that reacts with phosphorus fertilizer so we don't have clogging of the line so much so there's huge saving just there also when you buy um, single nutrients uh, let's say you buy just your alfalfa meal just your uh, rock phosphate and stuff like that. They're so cheap by the kilo compared to those other fertilizer and sometimes the fertilizer, fertilizer value is, is higher. So in the case of feather and blood meal, we're going to pay 2 to $3 a kilo and they're 14% phosphorus, which is still expensive agricultural world and in the cannabis world, it's dirt cheap for nitrogen. Yeah, you have a high value crop, so you can afford to put on these nutrients at, at optimal levels. Yes. You bring up a good point, though. Let's talk a little bit about bottled nutrients and what your background and thoughts and experience are with that and how a lot of growers are using them. And you've managed to grow for a fraction of the cost uh, without using bottled nutrients. Yeah, yeah. In terms of nutrients from start to finish, uh, we're about a couple cents per gram worth of nutrients uh, in our product. The bottle of nutrients, what I've seen from that, we've seen everything from people growing outside, they're going to have incomplete nutrients because people want to carry just one part nutrient. So um, the nutrient won't be complete uh, because when you mix calcium and phosphorus at high rate into a bottle, they precipitate, they go out of solution and they're not plant available. So this is why we have sometimes several bottle nutrients. Uh, but when you go in the horticultural industry, you never see those kind of nutrients. What you see is like single salt if you're not organic. So you're going to buy like a potassium, monopotassium phosphate, uh, so a 0, 50, mm -hmm. 30 and stuff like that that come in pounds of uh, like in bags of 50 pounds. And then you just dilute that in tank A, tank B. So basically what you're doing is you're making those every bottle that you have in your, um, your shop that you're buying on shelf. You're making giant tanks of that in your greenhouse and you're paying so much cheaper for for that because they've not been pre-mixed for you and also you're not shipping water around anymore. So most of those bottled nutrients, the primary ingredient is going to be water. They're diluting them down. Well, I mean, they're only 3%, sometimes 5% of a nutrient. Uh, so the, the rest of the 10, the 90% must be water most of the time. Yeah, we were talking before we started the podcast about how you don't really know what's necessarily in those bottled nutrients. And you had mentioned you don't like to use products where you don't know yeah. what's in them, uh, similar to what you put in your body. Do you want to expand on well, that Well, it's at just all? when we uh, we know so much about what goes in our soil, we uh, de develop those 
this living biology of you in your soil and all of that. Uh, so I know what my nutrient test is, and when sometimes you you see those nutrient additive and uh, that they're not necessarily used for their main nutrient, but they might have a hormonal charge, they might have microorganism, and they're just like lay, uh, marketed as like growth and answer bud thriving, and you have a picture of a giant frosty bud on it. And uh, when I don't know exactly what's in there, I find it hard to put that in a system that we've built and we fully understand and we know how it reacts to things. So, or also sometimes there's just not certified organic and we can't use them. But just as a general, with some growers are saying, when we do, when I do a little bit of consulting, I have this problem here. What should I add? Oh, well, this is this type of, they have an iron deficiency or a boron deficiency. They don't know what to add for that because there's nothing on their bottle that says use this for iron deficiency and, or uh, sometimes they will have a lot of other nutrients with a little bit of iron. So it's hard to pinpoint problems and assess in specific situation those bottle nutrients. Yeah, here in Washington, uh, when I got my soil registered as a fertilizer, it's really interesting. So I, I did a guaranteed analysis for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, mm -hmm. and calcium. Uh, so on the label, it says what a minimum amount would be. But as a fertilizer company, you don't have to say yes. what a maximum is. So I could have I could have 10% potassium in there and claim 3% and I'd be okay as far as the Washington State Department of Ag is concerned. And I don't, they don't, you don't know what the iron, manganese, any of those mm -hmm. other, you know, secondary uh, elements are. And so as a grower, it can be, I think it can be a real challenge unless you get an independent soil test to really know what you're putting on your yeah, plant. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And sometimes those products are better off like uh, having more product in there than less because, you know, so if they only have like 1% phosphorus when they claim they had five, that's a problem. But when they say minimum guarantee analysis and it's five and you have 10, sometimes it's a problem as well. So. Yeah, and especially for other product that I'm not going to name any brand, but there are some product that's been recalled off the shelf because they were not uh, sell as pesticide. They were just as uh, they would help for spider mites, let's say, but it was fully peritrines that were in the product and they were being on the shelf for years and nobody knew what there was in there. They're just never been checked before and it turns out it was peritrines and was an unregistered pesticide used on a crop. So this is dangerous for yourself, your labor, and your end user as well. That's that's a huge problem here in the States. I know for a fact that a lot of growers are using things that they're not supposed to use too, even even something they're aware of. So things like Eagle 20, Avid. Exactly. You're Obviously, you guys are uh, highly regulated by the Canadian government, and you're managing to do uh, deal with all of these problems without using any yeah. chemical pesticides. So what, what do you use for PM and mites and things like that? How do you manage these these problems? So the IPM program we have, the Integrated Pest Management, it's one of the cornerstone of our, all of our production. So for spider mites and any insects and all that, we do use beneficial insects. So we use a lot of uh, uh, Phytoxelis persimilis to control spider mite, Californicus predatory mite. Uh, we use Swarovski to control for thrips. Uh, we use uh, Theta coriaria and Ipoapsis for controlling fungus nuts. Uh, so we have we're able to achieve a, like a perfect level of control with uh, those beneficial insects. When I started to work uh, at Worcester Medical at first, uh, there were tents on some of the plants, a uh, fully spider web, the bud and stuff like that. Guys were vacuuming the buds every day. But after, oh yeah, it was pretty oh, wow. intense. I've never seen anything like that before. But after a couple of months and after meeting you and uh, Jaya Palmer that worked with you at Keep It Simple, like, introducing Californicus and a few other beneficial, just changing what they were using and increasing the frequency and rates. We were able to completely get rid of spider mites after one full cycle throughout our facility. And we've seen the odd little damage here and there, but I've never sprayed a single insecticide in my, uh, in my shop over two years. Wow. That's amazing. And you bring up a good point too. Uh, I think, I think it's important that listeners realize that these things are not instant uh, no. 
instant treatment solutions and it does take a little bit of time for these populations to build and you do have to apply them at at higher levels cannabis is a very sticky plant they're crawling through trichomes they spend time cleaning themselves up uh, uh, or maybe they even get high i don't know but there it's a very when you work with the plant yourself you feel it on your glove in your skins i can't imagine crawling through a forest of trichome to try to find food but mm-hmm. well trichomes are a natural defense system by the plan, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That being said, I feel I feel like it was fairly easy for us to get rid of that. But I was there every day checking on that, and I have a I have a, a academic background doing that. Uh, but when I went and introduced that same identical integrated pest management system in the other shop, we didn't at all with ice the same success rate. So the way you implement that system, the way you have your workflow through your facility is also very important. So moving from infested to clean area. So start and work in the clean area at first when you get there during the day, hair nets and changing boots. We do change uh, clothes from one room to another. We just put a lab coat on and change our hair net gloves and disinfect your boots. That, that's huge. We have, I have some growers here that like, were working in greenhouse. We started to do the biocontrol insect program. We had really good success in the vegetative, a little bit tougher in the f- flowering, but we, we were pretty sure that after one cycle, they would be pretty clean. But then on the next cycle, things got worse and we we're scratching our head trying to figure out what happened and all that to finally realize that it's the bamboo stick that the grower was using so as a, a stake. So he took the bamboo from harvesting a flower room that were infested with spider mites and put that into the new veg plants that were going in there. Even though he cleaned the room and all that, the spider mites run away from the predatory uh, insects. They crawl inside the bamboo stick, come out when it's uh, in, a, in a new room. So we have super high infestation rate from spiders right from the get-go so there's little details like that that if you don't pick on early or if you don't know it's just hard to manage but so your workflow out your labor and people move from one room to another it's super important everything also super important from your your mother room where you start there starting with clean product i usually just double the rates of insect uh, in my mother room compared to the rest of my facility, which has already kind of doubled compared to the rest of the industry, just to make sure that we're starting with clean product all the time. That's a really good point. I never would have thought of oh, mistakes. Yeah. That was such uh, a heartbreaker. At, at our farm, uh, being in a greenhouse and being out essentially outdoors, I find it's a very different situation. Uh, we can plant a lot of pollinators around the property, a lot of uh, a lot of plants that attract beneficial insects. And so I may see a mite here or there, but then I'll also see a ladybug and I'll see beneficial yeah. insects. And you don't have the same outbreak problems that you have to deal with in a closed yeah. facility like what you're what Yeah, you're unfortunately, in. just uh, pest insect make it in, in uh, closed environments all the time. They all, Often they will make it in from your staff or yourself if you're going and working in another group production facility or if you have some guys that have their personal production license at home they will drag the odd spider mites and thrips in there yes let's talk powdery mildew and fungal diseases a little bit here yeah what's your uh, game plan on that powdery mildew so cleaning the room very well between cycle one little thing that we've started to do ourselves. i've started to use ozone in my rooms between cycle so just an overnight uh, we shut shut off any exhaust. We keep the fan recirculating everywhere, and we have an uh, ozone generator in there on a timer. You got to be very careful with that because ozone is very toxic to people. So you don't want to be in the room. You don't want to have to have any of your staff in there. But ozone will uh, disinfect everything on contact because it's so oxidative. It just rips electron from everything. It's gonna go in nicks and micro cracks and just kill everything. So that's a pretty good one. So using uh, hydrogen peroxide, doing like a fumigation or foliar spray of the wall and everything. If you don't have the time to clean every pieces of dust and everything, getting rid of any wood in your growing room is also a good one. Pretty hard to disinfect wood and making sure that you have the least surface area possible aside your, your plant and your growing medium. So any overhead structures, if you have a lot of wire or anything that can arbor spores, 
if you can get rid of it, get rid of it. They have a cl- easy to clean room, but that's for prevention uh, or cleaning your room between cycle. For prevention on the plants, we, there's very few program product that we can use in, in Canada here. There's a Actinovate, which is a bacteria. Problem with Actinovate is if you spray two lates on your crop, you're going to create a false positive for your microorganism te- uh, microbial test, a post harvest test. So I got to be careful that you're, again, starting very early, starting on your mom, rotate through. We have Actinovate, also uh, Milstup, which is potassium bicarbonate. It's going to change the pH in the leaf surface, make it harder for the plant to, uh, for the spore to germinate. Those are the two that you can use. A sulfur vaporizer are also another good one, but make sure you turn them off for late flowering stage. Otherwise, you're going to give a half taste to your product. Those are all stuff that we can use, but also it's to stay on top of it. But also compost tea is a really good one. But again, be very mindful of your microbial test. Don't spray any of that when you have a room in flowering or anything past week two, because that's uh, that's a super highly charged microbial spray if you use a compost tea in foliar. So what it will do, it will basically put probiotics in the leaf. So you're going to have a... The goal when you're applying compost tea as a foliar is basically just to colonize your leaf surface. Even if your microorganisms that you're going to put in there are not going to do anything actively beneficial for the plants or actively fight PM. It's like having a, a room that's already so crowded that nobody else can get in. So you're trying to have a big party of microorganisms so big that uh, the powdery mildew is left on the porch because it's too crowded out there. So what do you do when you have a plant that obviously has... Uh, PM and you're let's say mid flower what's your protocol then oh I just hope it's not gonna happen (laughs) but what we did we did some uh, hydrogen peroxide spot spraying we're usually gonna get rid of that plant but we're gonna before we touch or do anything we're gonna spray down with uh, hydrogen peroxide which will only kill the spores hydrogen peroxide won't kill kill the live mycelium of PM so what we would do we would uh, bag it up and do uh, and just get rid of it and uh, hope for the best but we can take a little bit of pm uh if it's not causing too much uh crop loss or stress like that and we're we're gonna do like a super thorough cleanup of our rooms but uh it's it's so far finger crossed it haven't happened to us we also use a uh, uv lights in our hvac system so air systems constantly recirculating so by having UV lights, just household UV light, they're super cheap. There, you can get one for uh, they're 100 bucks. It's just gonna sterilize the air that flows around it. So it's gonna consistently decrease your airborne spore count in your room of any microorganism. So that's another good preventive thing to have at, at all time. And then genetics plays a key role. Absolutely. So if ever you're doing a little bit of breeding, again at the epigenetics level, if you're Parent plants have been subjected to mildew, and, or if you're doing breeding and trying to breed for mildew, I would suggest just infect your plant when they're um, in their in your breeding tent or whatever you're using to breed. Just infect your plant with mildew if you if you if you can afford that, and just let them breed seeds under PM condition, and then those seeds will be more resistant to uh, PM just from the epigenetic side. You can do that another generation and. You, you're going to have like already you have built-in resistance in your plant for that and some strains are just like so weak for pm it's just like you you can't even grow them they're going to get pm no matter what so let's talk about yeah let's talk about humidity airflow and pruning then in terms of helping reduce fungal pathogens one thing that i've seen too often unfortunately it's growers trying to mitigate fungal problems by keeping their room super dry uh, you're going to see like 40% humidity level, which stresses the plant, can jeopardize your yield and all that. Whereas if you prune the bottom of your plants for yourself, we're doing a kind of sea of green. Uh, so we need to have a, the good six inches off the soil clean up to have a good airflow in there. But if you have bigger plants, the leafing and keeping them, not like blasting with a fan, but airflow moving through them it's very important what you want to get rid of is this dew point when you have your lights coming on and off where your temperature is dropping you have a lot of moisture in the air as the air cools down and compacts then you have this dew point and 
high humidity level. And this is when your stomatal's pores, your stomata are still open on your leaf surface. It's very humid in the air, and then you're going to have a spore of PM germinate thing and making it into a stomatal uh, space and infecting the plant. This window of infection that you want to get rid of. So some, I think that's the Gavita that have like sunrise, sunset setting on them seems to be a, a good way to get rid of that dew point. Or self, we've been doing that by having a couple extra lights on a separate timer in our room that would stay for an extra 15 to half an hour on where the main, the rest of the light have been shut down. You could also set up your timer to f uh, refresh uh, the air when your lights are shutting off. So you're gonna have more cool air moving into your room instead of having that warm air cooling down and then just dumping all that uh, humidity back on your plants. So those kind of, uh, those kind of things. That's really interesting. I know I see at our farm, we always see PM whenever we have a, a big fluctuation in humidity. So where we have uh, a sunny day followed by a really rainy day or vice versa, then we'll typically see PM over the following yeah. week on all of our yeah. squash and, and things like that. And and the same with, with cannabis, we'll see people running, you know, you go from uh, a veg cycle where they may be at, I don't know, 60, 65% humidity and then switching into flower and just dropping that humidity to 40%. It's a huge shock for the plants. Oh, yeah. And uh, I... I want to save humidity for Jaya Palmer when I get him on here because he's got some really interesting thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah, Jaya's pretty sharp on that there. I still have yet to try a lot of uh, the cool stuff he came across with. Yeah, so I want to, I want to save that that piece, but I'm really excited to talk about it. I guess I, I want to ask you too, are you reusing your soil or what, how are, what is the workflow in terms of uh, plant size? You mentioned that you're doing Sea of Green. Yeah. Can you talk a little more about about all that and and then also uh well i want to talk to you more about little about soil mixing and, and nutrients too but we'll get into that in a sec so yeah we we just started to reuse our soil finally uh we move uh, into rolling beds so we have tables that will roll side to side in our room so we occupy more of our floor space instead of having five hallway in the room that allowed us to walk between a row of pots now we have just one hallway that we move wherever we want it into a room and we have uh, beds of soil that are about eight inches deep by four and a four and a half foot wide by 50 foot long with a, a smart pot custom liner in them and they're all in aluminum trellis so we got really the all the surfaces of uh, the soil are exposed to air so we get completely aerobic condition in our soil and since we it's a lot of work to move soil into those bed we've uh, we, we're reusing the soil uh, before we were not we were just giving it away to some local organic grower or soil but now we're reusing our soil when we find that it just gets better the more cycle we do in it the first cycle are pretty good but the second cycle Especially if you're careful with the, the tilling, we don't till it completely. We just mix in the first two, three inches of soil when we're re amend to mix in the. If we have to re amend, that's all based on a soil test. We just mix those nutrients into the first two, three inches of soil. We leave the the rest of the soil undisturbed, to not to disturb that mycelium that runs throughout the whole soil. And when we're replanting our plants, uh, we're just reconnecting to that mycelium, which is the internet of our uh, growing beds and then the plants just look the second round and third round they just take off and they look just so good so you bring up something that i talked about with steve solomon already and i have an opinion on and yours is going to be a little different so i want to hear it i know this whole no-till concept is really popular right now with indoor growers yeah and living soils my take on it is no-till is not totally accurate because we're not tilling the soil like we would agricultural land which is very very disturbing to the microorganisms yeah but when you're growing plants uh, a little larger than you are where the root systems are getting down you know six eight inches a foot down into the soil how do you get the nutrients down into that area uh, of the rhizosphere quickly in terms of a growth cycle? Because traditionally in agriculture, you know, you could till it in or top dress it. You have six, eight months or that off season for those nutrients to work their way down into the soil. Yeah. Uh, we don't have that luxury. You know, typically you're replanting, you know, 24, 36 hours later in some cases. Yeah. So if you weren't doing a sea of green, do you think you would have the same? Would you need to till the nutrients in further or would you still stick to that two, three inch? 
if if I had deeper soil, I would go maybe a little bit deeper, and you just you don't want to turn into you don't want to turn your soil surface into a a brick. Well, I mean, we're using sometimes a lot of uh, different uh, rock dust, glacial rock dust, or basalt rock dust, and of of course, if you're using high rate of that in just only two inches of soil, it doesn't look like super nice fluffy aerated soil anymore so it's a bit of a judgmental call of that i'm not gonna say i'm using no till uh no till i think like you mentioned really coming from the agricultural system i think there's beneficial to break up the soil a little bit but i haven't done the side by side test completely but to me like if i have to leave a layer of soil undisturbed it's i'm I'm fine with that i think it's it's potentially good but it doesn't mean that i'm don't want to disturb my soil. I want to disturb my soil. This is a little less possible. It's going to increase microbial activity, breaking your soil and some stuff. Uh, mostly aerobic bacteria will thrive after you do that. So how deep are your beds again? I missed that. Sorry. Oh, it's just uh, eight inches deep. Okay. And so you're putting the nutrients in the first few inches and then running a sea of grains. In the first half. And the first half of the soil then with the, with proper irrigation, they're going to go down in there. But also another cool thing that you can do is you can add worms to your beds and they're going to move your tub dress up and down for you. That's a really good point. Yeah. Or I found if you use worm castings, they typically have uh, cocoons in there already and eggs. And so you don't even need to necessarily add worms. They seem to just show up yeah, in yeah. a lot of cases. Yeah. Or just add them. They're pretty cool guys. Free labor. All right. So uh, let's talk. Let's talk specific nutrients. Now, uh, when I was talking to Steve, my experience, and uh, he seemed to agree with me, uh, is that cannabis seems to be a pretty potassium-hungry plant. What are you finding are the major nutrients? Because this whole idea of you know nitrogen in, in nitrogen veg, phosphorus in bloom, and apply cow mag is sort of the yeah. been the standard for the industry forever but it's really not that uh really not that accurate yeah potassium is uh you're gonna see it fairly fast and even though you have like level of potassium that sound like absurd for other crop like cannabis just like seems to thrive under those level what i found myself was done with potassium i think we have pretty similar level of potassium in our soil that tad you and i but what i've seen a lot myself and i've, I've walk through a lot of program and I've seen that it's iron deficiency. Pictures in magazine with plants that have iron deficiency, I've seen that by the end of flowering in week two and I've seen it in cell testing, we had those like big drop in, in our program, might not be true for our every growing program, but we were seeing huge drop in, in iron and we had this like apical, apical like paling of the plants when you're, the flower is starting to bud a little bit. So this is something that we've seen a lot. And we've seen that as soon as we add a little bit of uh, iron sulfate or glacial or basalt rock dust, then the plants are greening up already and you have this big fat stem that develops into a straw that feeds that bud without paling that plus of uh, color, the, the dark green. So iron was one that I've chased for a while. Have you done anything with manganese? Uh, Steve speculated that manganese would be a, a good one with cannabis. I yeah, I haven't done a lot of research or work with it. I think we we quickly talked about that once in the past. I do use uh, manganese sulfate and manganese. I remember I think it was the first year of the Canada, and I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was giving a talk about manganese and importance in hop and cannabis cultivation because that might have to be verified by someone else. But I think he mentioned that. Uh, enzyme that were synthesizing THC and some cannabinoids were using manganese and the more co- copy of enzymes that were expressed, the more manganese hungry your plant was. And I've experienced from level from 20 ppm of manganese to all the way to 150 ppm of manganese in your soil. And uh, that the plant seems to take it. That's, that's not a problem. I haven't seen too much manganese toxicity, but I make sure that manganese is there because of those enzymes. That's the premise I've been working with and we had pretty good results. So, And also I think those micronutrients are very important into the quality of your product, which is the iron, copper, boron, manganese, uh, and zinc, because they are all our enzyme cofactor and uh, all of those enzymes that are developing your cannabinoid, your terpene, your flavonoid, everything that makes the aroma of your plant. 
and if they're there and you have the, the proper, if you have the proper beneficial life that will produce siderophores to make it plant available, then you're really going to increase in your quality of aroma. You said it perfectly. Uh, I kind of want to change directions because you remind me of something. You had turned me on to a really good source of uh, insect frass. Oh, yeah. A few months back. And I... I think I bought like 12,000 pounds or something of it. Oh my God, I got so excited the first time I see that. I've bought a ton, I still, I still haven't used half of it, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, so talk to me about some of the benefits of insect fries besides just the uh, NPK associated with it. The microbial life in there, it's very interesting. We got it analyzed and those guys who are manufacturing that insect, uh, making that insect frass got it analyzed in a microbial charge is three times more concentrated than worm casting. And uh, when we worked with that stuff ourselves, we saw a lot of, uh, we found an amazing, an amazing chitinase producer in there. So this, this is a bacteria that we haven't identified yet. I think it got sent out for sequencing and that's been, um, Frank uh, Gagnebourg that I think you've talked with that's working with um, this biotechnology company in Quebec. They found this uh, chitinase production pr producing bacteria that what if you're using shrimp meal, crab meal or insect meal or anything, it's going to break down those chitin into oligochitosin and oligochitosin can be se sensed by the plant and uh, uptaken. It's going to trigger systemic acquired uh, resistance uh, that a plant immune system and the plant immune system is off sometimes to produce more secondary metabolite like cannabinoids and terpenes to prevent from an attack from insects so that was very interesting to to have that and made us switch a little bit more toward those uh, uh, fertilizer that are more rich in chitin like shrimp and crab meal so that was pretty cool and the, just the rest of beneficial life in there. There's some really good bacillus, subtilis species that we're solubilizing, phosphorus. So just just a general very good microbial life. The only, yeah, the only little thing there was some bacteria that may help nitrogen volatilization, but so we just got to be careful and use it, not just dump incredible deal, load of insect frass on your plant, and it should be all right. But it, it's it's a pretty good product. So how much are you using approximately? Are you top dressing with it? Or are you mixing it in your soil? Uh, both. So uh, I use it as a fertilizer and microbial inoculant in our soil. I use it in my composty mix and in my top dress as well. Okay. Wow. You're using a lot of this stuff. I though. know. I know. We're going to export it, hopefully. <laughs> I have it now. It was a great deal because insect frass is so expensive here in the States. So. Yeah. I think for, for whomever is using stuff like Shrav and Crypmio, and especially if you're reusing your soil, it's going to make your soil, the more duration, you, more cycle you're going through your soil, the more uh, single molecule of chitinase, the more chitinase you're going to have, the more your chitin is going to break down, the more plant immune response you're going to get. And I think that can lead to something pretty cool after like three, four cycle. Well, I need to start, uh, I need to start experimenting with it, but it's great to hear you give a really good scientific explanation for all these benefits. Okay, I wanted to switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit more about what's going on with cannabis up in Canada and anything in store for you in the near future or your facility. Everybody's talking about it. A uh, facility that are being created every uh, week. It's There's still not a lot. There's still so far only 42 across the whole country, but more and more are getting certified, getting inspected, and it's still only for medical production. But we've licensed producer uh, been told that the medical producer will be allowed to sell in a recreational market. So a lot of people are building facilities in the hope to position themselves for a recreational market. Uh, so yeah, and there is very few technical expertise right now in the industry. A lot of uh, people that have learned under the prohibition, uh, not so many people that are coming from academic or horticultural background so far. So there's a need for labor and worker expertise consulting. So it's pretty much, uh, it's a big boom right now. Or current facility, we're going to go 10 times the size that we are right now. We're going to switch, expand to a 60,000 square foot production facility. We're also experimenting with the, uh, 
LED lights from Fluence Bioengineering that have some very, very interesting lighting technology. Yeah, I, I'm talking to those guys and see if I can get them on here next. But I have my first shipment from them. Uh, I just got set up as a distributor with them. So I have my first shipment arriving hopefully this week. Oh, because uh, awesome. Yeah, cool. Well, uh, have you spoke with Mitch? Mitch is a really great guy there. No, I would love an introduction. I've only talked to Michael. He was going to send that up the chain, though, in terms of uh, being on this podcast, because I lighting is something that I know very little about. And I just pretty much uh, when Jaya said that he had talked to you about fluence and then done the research himself oh, yeah. between the two of you guys, I took that as as, as pretty much the, the best recommendation ever. Yeah. So I went ahead and, and placed an order. But I, I don't really understand. Uh, I always thought LEDs were way behind the times and they were the cost and and, and, yeah. and everything compared to you know HPS or high intensity lights just didn't seem I agree. didn't seem seem to add up like we weren't quite there yet. Yeah. Do you think the technology is yeah. there? There's been a big tipping point in the industry yes, uh, last year, so it still depends on how much you pay for electricity. We are paying electricity is very cheap in BC. It's like four cent a kilowatt, so it's hard to justify lights are using way less those lights that are using way less electricity unless they per- perform way better uh, i think in oregon you get 400 bucks like cash discount i think if you're buying led per fixture so it's huge like i just really wish we could have this kind of program yourself up here because it would make those fixtures way more affordable or the same price of other fixtures but i've been to their uh photo x conference uh last october in uh, austin texas and the amount of expertise coming out of the industry and I, I did the first trial with those their last generation of led that was like a pink christmas light looking led that the spider uh, x that was previous generation but now they are, came out with the white led that are fully full spectrum and that are having amazing performance and when it really like like appealed to me it's when i heard like people doing in commercial greenhouse production using their lights and pulling their their margins with those kind of lights. I was oh, there's something out there. So there's basal production facility of organic basal production in uh, Virginia. They're using those LEDs. So then when you see their setup, it's pretty amazing. So especially for vertical growing. So or self, we switched to LED and did some vertical uh, pre-veg racked in our mother room so we have a better light quality than under T5 the internal the plants are stacking better the plants look more like they've been growing under full sun the leaves are darker thicker and um, tighter and uh, internal then as they're producing so little heat you can have your plant growing very close to those uh, LEDs that, and having a high light intensity that allowed us to have like way more floor space in our mother room so we uh we took old nursery uh, transportation rack and then moved them onto vertical growing rack so they're on wheel we can wheel them around the facility they're under leds and then the, the plants are responding pretty well to that they are pricey though they are but um yeah they are so but if you look at uh the instagram of the poetry of plant nelson is a great guy that i've met at that conference and he's pulling 30% THC, three pounds of fix, uh, three ounces per square foot using those LED from Fluences. Wow. And he's close to, he's not fully, fully organic, but he's close to be. That's great. You know, you brought up a really good point that I want to highlight that what got you interested in them was the fact that you saw a commercial egg, you know, people growing yeah. plants at much, much larger, lower margins yeah, yeah, yeah. than what you're dealing with. Successfully using them is is huge because you won't find that basil grower using advanced nutrients or general hydroponics. You know, the, oh god, no, those products can't exist outside the cannabis industry for the most part. They're just too expensive, and you know, agriculture's found better options. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point for listeners to take into consideration when evaluating a product. Oh, yeah, just go tour your local greenhouse. Go volunteer there for a day or just go buy the product directly from the greenhouse and have a glance at how they're doing that. Have a look at their mixing tank, their injection system and stuff like that. And uh, those guys are, are know what they're doing and they're pulling way smaller margins than we do. And if, like... They can sell a pound of pepper for 50 cent wholesale. If you apply the same principles to cannabis, you 
probably going to do good. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, I love the fact that you have this uh, background in agronomy. Uh, and that's the one thing I see lacking in a lot of times in the facilities that I visit is they hire someone who's been growing cannabis, you know, for 20 years in a basement and haven't experienced commercial agriculture or know what it's like to scale that. Uh, they may be really good with growing, you know, with one particular line of bottled nutrients, but stepping outside of that can be a real challenge if you don't understand what's actually going into your soil or into your plant. Oh, yeah. And that and the real challenge is also like employee management and scheduling. And this is more than just looking after a few plants. There's way more going on. So you manage, you're managing plant and people now. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a good point. Yeah, and plants don't shout back at you usually. So that's why I like them. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to chat today, David. Uh, it was wonderful to get to catch up a little bit through this podcast. Much appreciated. Yeah, likewise, uh, Todd. Thanks for having me. And again, it's been a pleasure to meet a fellow like you in the industry. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, make you bring good people to the table and um, everybody's going to be the better off for, for it. That was David Bernard Perrone, lead agrologist and one of the head growers at the Whistler Medical Marijuana Corporation. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Stay tuned for future podcasts from leading experts around the industry. Don't forget that there's more information and articles available on our website and blog at www.kisorganics.com. And if you enjoy these podcasts, please take a moment to leave me a review on iTunes and send me your feedback and suggestions to our website contact page.